That's what they need to be learning Scripture. Can't beat that. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to Jeremiah chapter 9 with me this morning. And verse number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 9 and verse number 23. Jeremiah 9:23 Thus saith the Lord Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom neither let the mighty man glory in his might let not the rich man glory in his riches but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness judgment and righteousness in the earth for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. And Father, bless that holy word. And bless it to the people. Anoint it, Father, as it goes forth. May it go forth for the purpose that you intend it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There are passages in the Old Testament that just jump off the pages of the Bible. And they reach up and they take hold of you. And this is one of them. This prophet Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He's also the one that uh, cried out and said, Oh, that my head were a fountain, that I might weep for my people, for the slain of my people. Jeremiah truly loved his people. Jeremiah's life is quite a witness to his faith in God. But there was a time when his faith wavered, when he was cast into the miry pit. And there at the bottom of that pit, he began to cry out to God. And he said, Where are you? What have you done to me? What's happened? Why am I here? This is the same thing that happens to all humanity. We go through times when our faith is tried and tested in ways that we've never had it tested before. But the thing is that when it comes through it, it may come through it small. It may be a very weak faith. But my dear friend, if it is faith, it is faith. And there, who am I this morning that I'm able to, to tell, who, to measure how much the, a, a person's faith is? I have no ability to do that. If you believe, you believe. If you don't believe, you don't believe. But don't let it bother you because you're not on the mountain. Don't let it bother you because you may not be shouting right now. For those that are shouting, shout with them. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. To be on top of the mountain. To have the Spirit of God move in your soul. Like you're hearing in this house today. Rejoice in that. Don't ever put somebody down for that. You create a dead atmosphere and a dead spirit. That's the last thing you want to do. When you see people rejoicing in the Lord, rejoice with them. But some of you may not be in a state of rejoicing. Some of you may, this message may be for you. You may be far removed from that. You may be at a place where the Bible says that you could be a bruised reed. Or smoking flax. And this message would be for you. Because you're that individual who have tried. You've tried hard. You've, 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 you've gone the mile. You've gone the extra mile. But somewhere along the line, things didn't work out for you. You got hurt. You were bruised reed. That means that somewhere in church you got hurt. And you can get hurt in church. You can get hurt around church people. And your faith, something happened to it. Maybe you lost a loved one, somebody dear to you. Maybe you watched them suffer, and you wondered where God was during all that time of suffering. And you wonder, why didn't God move? Why didn't He do something? Where was He when all this was happening to me? If God said He'd never leave me, nor He'd never forsake me, why didn't I feel Him with me when I went through this? These are the kind of things that we all face. And so... Maybe your faith is as a, as, a, as a smoldering flame, just a, little, just a little bit left, not much at all, hardly even noticeable, but there is a little there. I want you to notice this, what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 40, Isaiah chapter number 42, rather, and verse number 3. Listen to this scripture very carefully, Isaiah chapter number 42 and verse 3, a bruised reed shall he not break. And the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Do you notice that? How that God is connected with truth and with judgment. And the Bible says when the Lord Jesus Christ sends the Holy Ghost into this world, that when He comes He'll convict the world or convince the world of sin and of judgment because they believe not on Me. God that I serve this morning, folks, changes not. 
He doesn't uh, deal with you in an underhanded, backstabbing way and then turn around and pour out His blessings on someone else as if He has he makes a difference between people. He does not make a difference. The Bible says that we all stand the same. There is no uh, respective persons with God. And so you need to understand today that whatever your brother or your sister may be going through at this moment, that my dear friend, there was a time in their life when they were on top of the mountain and they were shouting the victory. And they were coming out of the valley and they felt the power and presence of God in their life. And that's a good thing because you need that. Believe me, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if there's anything that Satan wants to rob you of, it's your joy. And if he can rob you of your joy, he's going to undermine your faith. Your joy is your ability to stand against your foe and against the problems of this life and look above them and to feel the presence of God with you and to know that everything, regardless of whether you understand it or not, it's going to work together for good for those that love God and for those who are the called according to His purpose. You are not the victim of some kind of fatalism where there is no guiding hand or there's no, there's no purpose or there's no reason in what's happening to you. That's just a bunch of garbage. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ today, not so much as a hair on your head can be touched without God giving permission. When we read in the book of Job, we know that Satan had to inquire of God before he could touch Job because there was a bar, there was a lime, there was a wall there was something that God had put around him. It's around you today. It's around every last one of us if we know the Lord. There have been times in my life when I was a bruised reed. There was a time in my life when my spirit was broken. I don't see how in the world I continued to get up in the pulpit and preach after that happened to me. I marvel at how I was able to do that. It was only by the grace of God. It was the hand of the Lord that allowed it to happen. I, I got a hold of somebody a whole lot bigger than I was. Somebody with a whole lot more power than I had. Somebody ministered grace to me when I was at my lowest point. And believe me not, my dear friend, my spirit was broken. And I went off into my closet and I got on my face and I cried. I prayed to God. There were times that I shut the door and I didn't say a word. I just cried for 15 or 20 minutes because it had reached so deep down inside my soul. And at times I said, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? But then I've seen how the hand of God has refashioned me and remade me and brought things out of me that needed to come out of me. And I can see how the Spirit of Christ is working in my soul. My outlook, my perspective, and all about my life began to change. It is that one to whom my friend molds us as the potter does the clay. And it wasn't my choice to make. It was His choice to make. And that is the good thing about serving the Lord. All I've got to do is say, Lord, here am I. Send me. And He'll do the job. Amen. And just trust Him when He does begin to move in your heart. And when He pressures you on one side, or He opens a door on another. Or He moves in your spirit one way or another. Leave it to the hand of God and stay away from people and their counsel because most men don't have a clue what they're talking about. It is a first-hand case. My life is not your life. What God does in my life is not what He's doing in your life. He's the same God. But He's got a reason for what He does. And so, I was that broken reed. And that broken reed comes to the point to where you become a smoking flax. And there's not much faith left. And if you leave it to men, they'll destroy your faith. Let me say this to you and give you good counsel this morning, dear friend. Get your eyes off of people. And put your eyes on the Lord. Put your trust in God and not in man. Men will let you down. But the Lord will never fail you. You say, well, preacher, that's easy. No, that's not easy to say. As I said to you a moment ago, I know what I'm talking about. And I know how that when I was down, and you're going to be down sometime, you're going to find the people that you put most of your trust in will stomp you when you're down. They'll kick you when you are at your weakest. And make no mistake about this, the ones that kick you and the ones that stomp on you are the ones that have no foundation themselves. I feel sorry for people like that. For when the wind blows, and when the sea rages, and when the trouble comes along, you will be the first one to fall. And your fall will be hard, because you're building yourself up over somebody else. 
God help you if you're one of them. If you spend all your time picking at somebody, criticizing people, tearing people down, making fun of them, and and and, and using them as 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 as, a, as a, some kind of a a comfort to you if you can find something bad in them. That's because you got nothing inside of you that's giving you life. There's no power in you. There's no joy in you. There's no power of God moving inside of you. And oh, how this petty junk. I've seen it work in the church and in the lives of people. Get out of it. Get in your closet and get on your knees and say, Lord, I'm a miserable case. That preacher's talking to me. Oh, I can't do anything for you because I find somebody I can hide behind. I can find you always will be able to. If you're looking for some weak need Christian, for some vacillating saint, for some soul whose life is in a terrible mess, friend, you don't have to look long. You don't have to look long. But let me tell you something. Listen to me real good now. I'm going to give you some advice that came from years and years of dealing with people. If you're looking for people and looking at people and hiding behind people and tearing people down and and you think that's building you up, I want you to go home and I want you to look in the mirror. And I'll guarantee you, when you look into that mirror, you're looking at one that is in worse shape than all of them that you're trying to tear down. You don't have a relationship with God. The moment you begin to have a relationship with the Lord, something comes alive inside of you. There's a fire that starts burning again. You're no longer focused upon people, but you focus upon Him. And you focus upon promises. And you focus upon the future. And your life is not about the here and the now. It's about the eternity. And when that begins to happen in your heart, something begins to move inside your soul where you've got something to give to somebody. And when you have something to give to somebody, let me tell you, this morning. This is something it took a long time for me to learn. If you want friends and you want people to be around you and you want people to, to, be, to be kind and good to you, you let something grow inside you that's worth having and they will come through the doors to get to where you are. If all you are is one constant negative put down, one constant negative uh, criticism, one constant negative defense Defeated life, you can count on this. All of your friends will leave you because they got the same problem and they don't want to hear it out of you. But if something is growing inside you that's good, they'll want what you've got. And you'll be amazed at how many friends you have that come around you. And that's a little advice that came from years and years and years of this stuff and dealing with these people and dealing with their problems and watching them as, they, as their life comes apart. I've counseled with people in that office right there who had a good marriage, and then they come in and their heart broken, and they pour their soul out to me, and they say, Preacher, I just discovered that my husband is having an affair. Or, Preacher, I just discovered that my wife is having an affair. And they're broken hearted, and their life is broken. That's a broken reed. And I mean, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, your whole life comes tumbling down. And then it's easy for the devil to jump all over you and say, Where's your God at? If you've been serving the Lord and living for Him, why did this happen to you? And the truth of the matter is that every one of us gives an account to God individually. And we have to answer individually for our lives. And if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. I've watched them. And here's my counsel I always give to people who who go through a broken marriage like that. I say, you stick with God. Your husband or your wife, they've turned away from the Lord. You stick with God. Maybe we can still heal this marriage. Maybe we can bring the two of you back together again. The human flesh is weak. You don't realize how weak you really are. A lot of people are shocked one day when they find out, when they find out how weak that they are and how powerful their flesh is. It shocks them. It shocks them. It shocks them. If you are living in la-la land, in fantasy land, and in a made-up world where you think that you're not capable of leaving your husband or your wife and having an affair with somebody, you're living in la-la land. It can happen to any of us. You've got to come to grips with the fact that in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And wouldn't even so much as lift his head 
toward heaven. There dwelleth in my flesh the same capability to do anything that I've ever seen anybody do on the face of the earth. So my job as a minister of the gospel is to come in and try to put together the broken pieces. It's to try to heal the broken hearted. It's to try to bring a soul to, 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 to try to bring some kind of light. To, bring, to try to bring some kind of peace into the midst of a storm. And I've seen it happen. I've said, now if you'll just stick with God. Stay with the Lord. Regardless of what happens to that other part, to your husband or your wife, you stay with God. I've seen it happen where they came back. I've seen it happen where the husband or the wife came back. And I've seen afterward a stronger marriage than they had before. And why? Because all of the doubts, all of the walls, all of the innuendos are now gone. And they deal with each other on an honest level. And they acknowledge the fact that they're both capable of of, of anything. And that marriage can truly be healed and become a strong marriage. And that marriage can be a witness to others who are having problems in their marriage. But it brings forth a simple principle from the Word of God. You that have received grace can minister grace. You that have been forgiven can forgive. You that have been healed know where healing comes from. That, my dear friend, is one of the great lessons that a lot of people never learn in this world because they have this, they have this Pollyanna type uh, Mickey Mouse type attitude that once they, once they get to a certain point in their life that they're beyond temptation, that they have been sanctified to where sin will no longer bother them, and you're living in a glass house and in a fairyland, and your fall will come quicker than you could ever imagine, and when you fall, you'll hit harder than you ever thought you could, and you'll come to grips one day with the reality that this is in an accursed world, that you live in an accursed world, and that that world world will curse you if it possibly can. And only by the grace of God will you ever see victory in this world. Now, if you're in this house today and you're saying, well now preacher, I'm one of them that have, I'm a smoking flax. I'm a bruised reed. What can you do to heal me? I really can't do anything to heal you, but I can tell you about the one that can. I can tell you what he can do for you. Let me tell you what the Bible says. To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. Now, I want you to meditate on that. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about a hurdle that you got over somewhere in your walk on this earth that changed you. Somewhere you did something you never thought you would ever do. One day you woke up in a state in your life that you never imagined you could ever be. And you counseled with some people and they told you that you would committed the unpardonable sin. Or they told you that you had to feel this or feel that in order to get right with God. They told you that there's something that you had to do. Well, let me tell you something that will help all of you this morning. It's already been done. Now that may sound simple, but that's the truth. It's already been done. I have no patience with any preacher or any religion that puts anything between you and the finished work of Christ. When I say finished work, I mean finished. So your forgiveness is not based upon how you feel. Your forgiveness is not based on what you can do. Your forgiveness is based entirely on what He's already done. And you simply accept that by faith. Like you accept salvation by faith. You say, preacher, can the Lord really forgive me? Because I feel the lowest, sorriest, sinking dog that ever walked the face of the earth. That's good that you feel that way. But that's not the kind of life God's going to let you live. It's okay to feel convicted about your sin. It's all right to feel the hurt that you've brought on other people. It's okay to understand that what you've done will have its ramifications in the lives of other people. I've noticed this, dear friend. There are few people that I've ever met in this world that when they sin, it only affects them. When you sin, it affects a lot of other people. And it always affects innocent people. And so, my friend, it's okay to feel bad about what you've done. But feeling bad about what you've done doesn't get you forgiven. 
you can continue to feel bad about it. As a matter of fact, that's where Satan enters into the picture. For the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the accuser of our brethren is cast down. These accusations that come from Satan wants to drive a wedge between you and God. You see, if he can get you to the point to where you constantly and perpetually whine and feel bad about how sorry low down you are, you'll never get to the place to where you can accept the forgiveness that is freely given to you. Hallelujah to God at the cross at Calvary. When I look at the Lord Jesus, I say, Lord Jesus, you know that I'm but dust. You know that it's all I am. And Lord Jesus, there's not a thing I can do to pay for my sin. I can't do anything to wave and wipe away what I've done. But I can sure do this. I can accept what you did for me. And Lord Jesus, forgive me. In the name of Jesus, cleanse me by the precious blood. And you'll be amazed at how that simple thing like that will give you power over the power of sin and the devil. Now, some folks here in the house to say, well, now, preacher, you know, you're just preaching to bad people <laughs> because I'm a good person and I don't do stuff like that. And, and I mean, I, and I, you know, preacher, I, it's just not in me. My parents raised me better than that. Well, I'm glad they raised you good. Hallelujah to God. My parents were nowhere around when I grew up. My grandfather and grandmother are the ones that raised me. And they sent me to church and took me to church. And I'm thankful for the fact that I wasn't raised up in a home somewhere. I thank God for that. But I'm going to tell you something right now. The Bible says here in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 9, that these things I delight in. And that, my dear friend, is an indication of the character of God. The character of God is that every one of us gives an account to God for the life that we live. And the Apostle Paul says plainly that in his flesh, that's his fleshly mind, his fleshly body, dwelleth no good thing. You need to understand that when he said, even though that I am saved in First Timothy, he said, of all the sinners on the face of the earth, I'm chief. Now, he wasn't saying that to feel sorry for himself. He didn't say that because he wanted to wallow around in self-pity. He didn't say that because he was beaten to death of the devil. He said that to acknowledge how great the grace of God is. For God can forgive. He said, plainer words, if he can forgive me, a murdering devil like I was, if he can forgive me after what I did, he can forgive you for what you've done. That's growing in grace. When you talk about growing in grace, you're talking about growing and understanding the will of God and understanding the grace of God and understanding what it is to be forgiven. Now, some of you can come down to the altar and you can pray and, and feel good about it and that's all good. But then somebody does something to you and you might as well forget ever forgiving them. For a lot of people, they just don't, can't find it in themselves to forgive somebody else for what they've done. Now, mind you this morning. I've had people do things to me that enraged me. I've had people do things to me that later on I get to think, every time I think about it, it makes me mad. Amen. I've had people do things that I saw the sinister motive. I saw what a backstabber. I saw what an opportunist. Boy, religion is full of opportunists. Oh, yes. If they see something going on in a church, they'll come like, they'll come like a pack of wolves and try to pluck people out and pluck them out here and pluck them out there. And this and that. You say, well, that goes on in the church. Listen, there's more competition in the church than there is in business. And the competition in the church house is not like business. In business, they advertise what they're doing. You know what, you, you know what you're buying. In the church house, it's all covered up with this pious talk and pious faces and all of this stuff, you know. I mean, there's a, there, here's a, you've got two levels of communication in the church. Okay? It's quiet and you're listening. You've got the external communication. How you doing, brother? God bless you. It's good to see you today. Glory to God. But underneath what you're really thinking with some folks is entirely different from what you're saying on the surface. And you're good at it. Listen, when they start handing out these, these, these uh, what do they call that thing, the Oscar, when they, uh, for acting? Why, well, folks, I've seen some of the best actors I've ever seen in my life in the church house. Well, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, good actors. Good actors. Good actors. Oh, yeah, real good at it. Uh, how many agree with what I'm talking about here this morning? Good, I'm glad. I, hallelujah. Honest. Oh, yeah. But you see, these two levels of communication define what goes on in religion. And so it is of the same thing with churches. And it's such a shame that it has to be that way. 
And I hate it because it's that way. Because the way it ought to be is that when you come through that door right back there, you all acknowledge that every one of you are sinners. And you all acknowledge that, but by the grace of God, I'd be in hell right now. And you all acknowledge that it takes the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to cleanse us from all sin. And you all acknowledge that you can freely receive what God has freely given. And you come before Him and as worshipers, you say, Lord Jesus, oh, I was lost, but now I'm found. Amen. I was unsaved, but now I know you. And your blood has washed away my sins. And you ought to do it honestly. And you ought to take hold of the hand of that one standing next to you. And underneath you can say to yourself, I know you're a sorry, low-down, stinking dog, but I know God loves you like He does me, and He's forgiven you like He has me. My brother, I believe it. God bless you. And hug each other. Now, that's the real world. That's the real world. Don't put on airs. Don't come in here acting like you... Don't Listen, nothing makes God any sicker than somebody that comes to church on Sunday as one person, and the rest of the week, there's somebody entirely different. Amen. Hallelujah to God. That's the truth. I mean, folks, what you are, to, what you see is what you get. That's the way it ought to be, right? And so when you come to the house of God, you ought to come in here and you ought to come together and you ought to remind yourself, we are sinners freely forgiven by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, when I was a young Christian in Christ, young Christian, the church I went to, had a good pastor. His name was Bill Cardwell. He was a good preacher. And he came into that church and he started preaching the Word of God and people started getting saved. And I mean, the altar was filling up with people. And it was about that time I got saved. I didn't get saved in the church house. I got saved in a person's home, sitting on the sofa. But what happened to me came forth from the church house because of the moving of the Spirit of God. God was there, and He was moving in the lives of people. You could, you could see people get up and they could weep, and they weep with joy. We, we saw people get saved in that church that had been members of that church for decades. And they got born, and we saw deacons getting saved, and everything in the world they were getting saved. But do you think something like that can happen without the devil rising up and coming against? The devil rose up and came against that messenger. They came against Bill Cardwell. Oh, did they ever rise up. I was a young babe in Christ. I was just a... I mean, folks, I'm talking about green as green and green could be. And I didn't know anything. But they came against him and brought charges on him. And we had a business meeting called one night. And all of a sudden, all these people come in. I think it was a business meeting. I don't forget to exactly, but I know this. I know that one night we had a bunch of people show up that I hadn't seen before. I thought, man, we haven't revival or something. What's going on in here? I mean, all these people that came out of the woodwork, they were all over that church. I thought, glory to God, what's about to happen? These people had their names on the roll of that church. That's why I don't hold a whole lot with roll calls. You say, I'm a member of Temple Baptist Church. I haven't seen you in two or three years. You sure you're a member here? (laughs) That's what I go by. I don't belong to Robert's Rules of Order. I belong to a living, breathing organism. And are you, are you a member? Well, anyway, these people showed up, and here they are. They popped up, and they started bringing accusations against this pastor. And they, started, and they wanted to get rid of him, and they wanted to get up and start voting. And I'm telling you right now, some of them in there were pushing others to get up and say something. And here I sat, and I got mad, and I got madder, and I got madder, and I got madder. And I hadn't been saved any time. I was a babe in Christ. And here I'm sitting in the midst of all this stuff. And I'm watching these people pop up. And I love this pastor. This was the man preaching when I got saved. I, you know, I didn't know anything. But I know, I know the hand of the devil when I saw it. And I popped up. And I looked around. And I said, I'm going to tell you, who are you people? <laughs> what are you doing in here, coming in here to vote against this pastor? I've been in here every day since every time the doors are open. I've been in here now, and I forget how long it was, a year, year and a half. I don't remember. But I was there every time the doors were open. I said, where in the dickens you been? Well, you coming in here to vote this man out. You're coming in here to vote him. See, what they've done is call all their family members together and got their forces arrayed. And they came in there, and they came in there to destroy that pastor and throw him out. And I let them know that night what I thought about him. I really did. Because they had no business coming in there, popping up and jumping up to say something about that preacher. Even though they might have had their name on the roll, they did, they, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a situation where they were trying to destroy the ministry of a man of God 
And it hurt my faith. It hurt my faith. Because at that time, I was just fighting. I didn't know anything else. And it hurt it. And I had a sinister attitude for a long time toward church people because of what happened to me in that church service. Maybe you've been in a church service somewhere and they've run a pastor off, a good man of God. You say, well, he made a mistake. I've made more than one. You want me to tell you, tell you about, about all of them? Let's meet after church today and I'll write you a list of all my mistakes and give you all kinds of ammunition to run me off with. Are you listening to me? Are you looking for a perfect man? You'll never find him. All pastors make mistakes. I've done some things in the past that I regret. I did it out of ignorance sometime and for whatever other motive. I regret it. And if there's any way I could go back into the past and change it, I'd change it. But I can't do anything about it. It's already passed now. So what am I going to do? Am I going to go around licking my wounds and whining and crying over it the rest of my life? No. I'm going to get on my face and say, Lord God, here I am. I've messed up again. <laughs> and, you know, help me. Help me. Lord, help me. Help me. And God will come back and He'll help you. God doesn't have perfect preachers. He doesn't have perfect preachers. They don't exist. All I'm looking for in a pastor is a man with a good heart. If a man's got a good heart and he wants to serve God, he'll make mistakes, but he'll stick in there. And if he makes a mistake and finds out about it later, he'll do something about changing that mistake. But I can watch that and I can live with that. I can live with that. But I know people right now that will never darken a church door unless the grace of God moves in their life again. Because they saw what a backstabbing bunch did to their pastor and ran him off. And, they have, and they're mad about it and they'll never get over it. And they have to live with the rest of their life. And Satan's going to live, put them in a defeated state and they'll never have any power. They'll never have any victory. Remember this, folks. You are frail people. You are capable of error. You can make mistakes. You can say things in a spur of the moment that you'll regret later. You can do things that you wish you'd never done before. Young Christian, let me tell you this. I wish somebody had told me this when I first started out. These people in here, some of them in this house, as the house that I was in, may have been in this church for 20 or 30 or 40 years, but they are as big a baby as you could possibly... You can't imagine what a baby they are. They never grew in the Lord. But then you can also watch young ones get saved, and you can watch them as they seem like they shoot up like a weed, as they begin to grow in the Lord. Satan will destroy a temple. Now somebody, some of you will say, now, good night, preacher. What's going on? Nothing. <laughs> At least I'm not aware of it. <laughs> Nothing. Well, you say, why are you preaching a message like this? Shut the gate before they come through it. <laughs> when your cow's out, it's too late then to shut the gate. <laughs> we moved in this old house up here, and there's a garage up there. That garage is still up there. I'm telling you the truth. I went in that, house, in that garage one day, got back in the back, and looked on the wall, and it said, Cow got out such and such a date. Then down below it, cow came back, such and such a date. <laughs> this used to be a farm. So when the cow's gone, it's, <laughs> that's no time to shut the gate. When the cow's gone, leave the gate open, cow may come back. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I wish I could help some folks. I really do. I wish I, I, wish I knew what to say by the grace of God to help you. Don't put your faith in men. Get your eyes off people. Accept them for what they are. Pray for them. Pray for each other. Bear one another's burdens. You've got convictions. You've got, you've got, you've got things about your life that you hold to. Hold to them. You don't have to compromise what you believe and compromise who you are. But there's always a weaker brother or a weaker sister around you. And they need help. They need help. And it's an indication of who you are and what you are if you can reach out to them and help. That's a good indication. If you can reach out and help them, it shows you that there's something going on inside here that's good and it's strong and you're growing in it. Amen. Because a weaker brethren, as the apostle says in the book of Romans, 
A weaker brethren is so easily offended. He's looking for perfection and you're not going to find it. Look for reality and look to the perfect one. And the perfect one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thy name I pray. That you'd use what this preacher said this morning. I wish somebody had counseled me like that, Father, when I first got saved. So much petty stuff, so much backstabbing, so much backbiting, so much of that stuff. But I'm thankful, Lord, that you taught me what I needed to learn. You brought me through it. And Father, you know this morning I'll stand before thee, Lord, is reared back and proud of my achievements and my accomplishments. Lord, I, I, I wouldn't be here right now, but by the grace of God, I haven't achieved anything. It's only by the grace of God that you've used me in spite of me. Amen. 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 And Father, I pray now that you'd use what I've said in the service and help somebody. Somebody needs help. This was for somebody. Somebody was about to go under. Somebody was falling. And they needed this. I pray for them. In Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake.